All right. So Jennifer Dodds is here with us this morning. She participated in our community collaboration series last year, which was our first kind of trial and error go about with this whole new collaboration here. Um, and her session was a huge hit. I had so many parents come back and say how amazing it was and how they really walked away with something that they could try like that day with their child. Um, so I was super excited when she agreed to present this year again. So with that being said, Jennifer, I will hand it over to you. Perfect. Well, thank you guys for being here. Let me get my slideshow all set up for us here. All right. Let's see. Alrighty, hang on just a second. Actually, let me let me swap this out real quick because I want to be able to see y'all's faces while we do this. So I learned you can do picture in picture on here and do that. So let's see. Alrighty. Okay, so thank you for being here. My name is Jennifer Dodds. I own Ability to Reimagine in Fort Mill, South Carolina. So not too far from um, John Crosland. And I do testing for kids for autism, ADHD, anxiety, um, all those various things. I also do things like gifted testing, emissions testing, um, so a lot of testing. But I also do um, some small groups too where we work on executive functioning skills, work on anxiety, um, some individual counseling. So um, anxiety is one of my favorite topics to talk about, I think, because uh, we have all experienced this to some degree in our lives and it is so prevalent amongst our youth these days. Um, so I was excited to get to chat on this topic again this year. Um, this year, we're really going to focus, too, on raising resilient kiddos. So um, unfortunately and fortunately, um, anxiety is just part of our life. Um, I always like to point out to people that without some level of anxiety, you would, you know, obviously walk in front of a car or not study for your test or some of those things. It does, you know, there's definitely some healthy pieces there, but it can get to a place where it's unmanageable. And so that's what we're going to talk about. What are some good preventative strategies that we can use? Um, and then also, what are some things we can do once it has started? But using those times as teachable times, um, times where we can learn something or help our child learn something that they can take with them to the next time they may experience it. So we will jump in. So if anyone wants to be a wonderful volunteer this morning, you win a, a you win a huge prize. Carrie's going to give it to you later, I promise. No, I'm just kidding. But um, what would you guys say if you can think of anything you can put in the chat box or even um, just unmute yourself. But what would you say something you've noticed amongst with your kids? Uh, what is different now that you what's something that you face <coughs> now that they didn't always something that the land in the landscape of life? What do you notice with your kiddos that are different stressors from what we experienced growing up? Anything anybody can think of? Social media and phones for sure. Absolutely. That's Not usually not, but yeah absolutely i think that's usually one of the biggest ones that um, comes to mind is we have just unlimited access to information and that's where we'll kind of dig in a little bit here is what what has changed um, and a lot has changed when we talk about social media there's good things you know and and all the technology i know my i have my 90 year old grandmother who can facetime and will send me a text sometimes and say, I hope you have a good day. And I think, you know, that's a wonderful piece when we talk about what technology has, has brought to us. Um, and then we have the, you know, in classrooms, a lot of times teachers will run Twitter pages or Facebook pages where kids can see updates of things. Um, and that's great too. But we also know that from social media, we've gotten a lot of things that also really are stressors, big pieces for our kids um, that have changed kind of the landscape of what they experience. Um, and when we talk about what those are, we know that with social media or screen time in general, that that increases the risk of mental health difficulties. Um, and especially as it relates to social media, we see that the chances of developing some kind of mental health condition as a result, possibly as the result of the social media exposure is much higher. Um, and not only social media, but just the access that we have online to information has changed drastically. Um, like think of, you know, with COVID for instance, what kids were seeing online about it every day. I see a lot of kids in my office who have a lot of health health related anxiety, um, which I would say, you know, likely is the result of some things they've experienced that we didn't experience. You know, in the past, it's not that there haven't been, um, 
you know, pandemics or things like that, but we didn't have all day exposure to those things online that they have now. Uh, we also look at a narrow definition of success. I'll, I think this is an interesting one, um, but one of the things that stands out to me, and I know from being in schools before being in private practice, um, is when we talk about like kids' expectations for reading. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to hold kids to high standards. But for instance, in the past, um, in, the, in the 1990s, they surveyed kindergarten teachers and said what percentage, or, and they were looking at what percentage of teachers expected their children to be fluent readers by the end of the year. And that was about 35%. Um, whereas in 2010, that was about 75%. So we know especially how that affects our kids with disabilities. Um, it is something that's challenging as far as they're held to a higher level of what we expect for them to, to do at that age. Like we expect our kids to graduate from high school with all these plans and ideas and where they're going, what they're doing, what their major is going to be, all of that stuff. And we really need to kind of think of, okay, you know, let's scale it back a little bit there and, and, and look at what we, how we define success. Um, and lastly, one thing I want to point out, too, is just the access to the addictive substances we have now. Um, there's always been access to things like, you know, cigarettes and stuff like that. But now we have things like jewels and vapes, things that parents and teachers can't always see. You can take to the bathroom with you. Um, and I know from before I did private practice, I was in a middle school primarily um, as a school psychologist. And my office was across from the school counselor's office. And I heard lots of incidents all day. Um, of kids who would, you know, take, you know, kids who come from great families, you know, with parents who are very involved, but who had gotten involved in this. And we know that, uh, you know, vaping in particular increases anxiety substantially. So there's just a lot of access and exposure that kids have now that they did not always have. Um, and so we'll kind of talk about the landscape of what we're dealing with. And then we'll talk about what strategies and tools and things can we use. All righty. Keep on going. So we'll talk about the data. Started in on that a little bit. We'll talk about what anxiety is and isn't, how to differentiate between different conditions, and talk about what are some strategies we can use. All right. So this has been updated with the most recent data that is out. Um, but when we're looking at anxiety as a whole, 9.4% of children will have the or meet the criteria to be diagnosed with anxiety um, at some point in their childhood. And that's pretty high because we're not talking about just children who are experiencing a little bit of anxiety here and there as it relates to testing or maybe a little social anxiety in bigger settings. These are kids who are, first of all, have the resources to go out and get diagnosed, um, meaning that there's probably a lot that are still undiagnosed. And then also who have it at a level that is very impactful and impairing in their life. Um, and we'll talk about kind of how that's changed over the years. But it does tell us that that is that's pretty substantial. Um, and you'll see, obviously, there's some other diagnoses there, too, but um, we'll focus mostly on anxiety today. So you will see here the likelihood being diagnosed with anxiety varies in different ages, ages 3 to 5, 6 to 11, and then 12 to 17, you'll see there, too. Obviously, it's the highest as you get older. We know that there's more stressors as kids get a little bit older and are supposed to be more independent. Um, but they're still likely, you know, it's still likely that they could be diagnosed even as young as three years old with separation anxiety or even just struggling with transitions and things like that. And so I want to chat about the differences in anxiety amongst kids who have other conditions as well. So we know for kids who have learning disabilities, it does increase their chance of having anxiety. Um, learning disabilities don't cause anxiety, but it's kind of a chicken or the egg conversation here because we know that when students are anxious, that tends to impact a lot of their brain functioning, their processing speed, their visual attention, um, all of those pieces there. And whenever you're a particularly anxious child, you know, if you have pretty significant anxiety, it can lead you to develop gaps at school. Um, but we also know that kids who have learning disabilities, like say you have dyslexia, um, you are going to be more anxious in general in the classroom setting because you're going to be presented with a lot of things that you don't always know how to do. So I think one good thing, you know, we're talking about what John Croslin offers is that for a lot of kids who have a disability, like say they have a learning disability, they're already provided with supports um, for things in the classroom to kind of help ease some of that. So there's a um, level of, you know, are we sitting close to the teacher? Are we able to redirect or uh, re talk about the same material again, kind of reteach that material? Um, so those things help there, but it's just something kind of to keep in mind is that there is a relationship there. All right. Same with autism, um, it does increase the chances by 40 percent 
um, if you have autism to be diagnosed with anxiety. We know for kids who have autism spectrum disorder that they have a harder time with transitions often, um, wanting to stay with routines, sensory processing difficulties, all of which kind of raise that level um, as far as what your body is able, your body and mind are able to tolerate. Um, so for a child who doesn't have autism, they may not be as bothered by such a busy classroom or the noises. Um, for a kid who does, that does increase your chances of stress, worrying what situations might you be put into where you're uncomfortable, um, you know, those kind of things there too. And just kind of to keep in mind here, before we jump into talking a little bit more about what anxiety is and isn't, um, the diagnosis rate from 2016 to 2020 went up 30%. Um, and something to keep in mind there is that's before COVID. So I would guess that probably has gone up even more since then. Um, and when we're talking about that, a lot of times the question is, are we just diagnosing more kids? Um, but generally the diagno not, diagnostic criteria has not changed. Um, it's, it's the same that it was. It's likely the stressors that we're experiencing with the social media, um, increased awareness. I think a lot of our parents now have more awareness of what anxiety is to be able to pursue some kind of help for their child. Um, but also just kind of the landscape of the life in the world we're living in now has contributed to these things. But some good news, um, good and bad. So North Carolina ranked 24th nationwide as far as supports for mental health. Good news is that was 40th last year. Um, so we have seen a significant, uh, number one is best, but we have seen that they have um, increased quite a bit as far as supports go. And when we say rank 24th, that means that that is the rating as far as the access to mental health care for people who are experiencing mental health difficulties. Um, and that's what we'll talk today about a lot of preventative strategies because um, obviously we wanna be able to be on the preventative side rather than reactive because we know there is such a um, lack of access to care. I don't know, you know if you have ever reached out for any kind of support for um, your child or yourself or, or another loved one, but sometimes your wait list for any kind of therapy or counseling, any kind of support can be very long. Um, and sometimes insurance doesn't cover it. Sometimes therapists don't take insurance. So there's a variety of different pieces there, but it's not easy usually to get support. So we want to try to prevent a lot of these things on the front end and try to help manage them. So if we do, you know, eventually need to reach out for support, um, you know, we've done everything we can before we have to be on some kind of wait list there. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about anxiety and what it is and isn't. Now, we all know what anxiety is, uh, but I think it's important to point out because I, you know, a lot of what I work when I work with families is we're picking apart what's causing what. Um, and sometimes we'll come in because we see some challenges that might look like ADHD or something that looks like anxiety. Um, and we're trying to figure out, is it one or the other or are they causing each other? Where's all of this coming from? So I think it's important to think, you know, if you notice a lot of these signs and symptoms in your child, um, where do we go from here? How do we figure out how to treat it and make sure that we're not treating a symptom of a symptom? Like, for instance, autism and ADHD, a lot of the symptoms related to this can cause anxiety, like with ADHD, forgetting to do your homework, um, having a hard time with executive functioning skills. When you get in a pickle because of some of those things, you, you get anxious, um, which can lead to school anxiety, stuff like that. So we want to make sure we don't just treat that anxiety. We treat the, the core reason. As you look at this list, um, you will see that there are a lot of different symptoms there that can apply to a lot of different diagnoses. Um, difficulty sleeping. That could be, you know, tons of different things can cause that. Um, we look at things like irritability, any kind of panic attacks, struggling to relax, appearing tense and jumpy. So those are the big pieces there that we'll see um, with anxiety, but also with different things. So one thing I usually encourage parents to do if we are seeing anxiety at a level that's pretty significant, is to go do some kind of medical workup with your doctor. Um, it is interesting. There are quite a few things like vitamin D deficiency, thyroid issues, um, sleep sleeping issues where kids are um, having a hard time breathing at night and so they're not getting quality sleep. There are a lot of different things can, that can contribute to this. So it's always good if this has been going on for a while, go do some kind of medical workup with your doctor. Make sure and rule out that anything else could be causing it. Or even if it's not the only thing causing it, could it be making it worse? Because when we look at anxiety, there's a lot of different things that can cause it. We look at genetics. Um, and something that's really interesting there is new scientific research that's coming out. Um, and I just follow it. I'm not the, um, you know, I don't have a medical degree there. But I'm, it's very interesting in that we're seeing that the expression of genes can affect whether or not it's passed on to children. Um, and, and that's promising because... 
when you think about your characteristics and traits, you think that, you know, you'll definitely pass those on to your own children or there's a high chance of it. But it's promising because it tells us that if we get those things treated effectively in ourselves, it can affect whether or not we do pass that on. So it's motivation. Um, you know, I think for if you're, you know, you're thinking about kids or or whatever for your kids, kids in the future to seek out therapy or some kind of treatment, because if you can control um, somewhat what you're experiencing, then you may not pass that on. But I'll be interested to see as that continues to emerge, what that looks like. Um, as far as other causes, you know, psychological, like a lot of our learning occurs unconsciously, like up to 95% of it. So that's through watching other people playing with other kids. So I think it's always good to keep that in mind. Um, if, you know, as a parent, you're a naturally anxious person, um, making sure that you kind of know that about yourself, that you're aware of it to try to avoid um, projecting some of that onto your kiddo. Um, and then environmental too. So life changes. That can be anything from, uh, you know, moving, changing schools, going up grades, not eating well enough, not getting enough sleep, all those pieces there. And we want to play a little bit of, do a little detective work too. Um, you know, when we think about anxiety, there are times that we have it and it is totally, we cannot figure out why. Um, it's totally unexplained and out of the blue. Now, if you really dig in and you sit with yourself for a minute and with your child, you'll have to kind of coach them through how to do this, but also kind of you taking a look at what they're doing. What could it be communicating? Is there, and sometimes we can't help those things. Like it could be communicating that them moving to, you know, first grade from kindergarten was really hard for them and, and they still have to make that move. But we have to think, what could it be telling us? Has there been a big change in the family? Um, are they overextended? And I have this conversation a lot. Um, when we look at after school activities, some kids can handle an after school activity every day. Some kids can't, and that's okay. Um, some kids are more introverted and they go to school during the day. That really drains their social battery. And then they come home and they really need to do a quiet activity. Some kids, they go to school and then they want to just come home and keep going, going, going. Um, and that's fine too. So I think it's good to ask yourself, are we in too much stuff? Is there anything we can kind of pair back um, and, and really ask is, you know, do we really need to do as many lessons and activities as we're doing? Looking at screen time, um, we'll talk about that too. What are the recommended screen time amounts for different ages? Getting enough sleep, anything interesting going on at school that seems to be different, that they change seats at school, is there something going on there? Um, so I think it's always good to just, sounds really simplistic, but think, you know, I try to do this even with myself when I'm feeling like I'm really, overextended and stressed out with work stuff that I have to do. What's going on? What can I change next time? Did I put too much in one week? How can I try to fix this a little bit? I'm trying to use it as kind of a learning experience there. And like we talked about earlier, there's a lot of co-occurring conditions. Um, so if you're trying to figure out, you know, these behaviors you're seeing from your child, you've tried treating it as anxiety, you've tried treating it as something else, and you're like, I don't know if we're really getting to the true cause here because we're not seeing much change. Um, and, you know, we do have some good research based treatments for anxiety. So if we've tried those things and it's not working, it would be a good time to, to reflect and say, is there something else going on? Um, and usually here's the most common things I see. ADHD um, is one that can be common, especially in females, um, as far as that the symptoms you don't always see as much as you do in um, as you do in males. So sometimes they may be experiencing like the racing thoughts the hyper focus on situations that may have happened, um, difficulties paying attention to school, but you can't see as much of that. Um, and so sometimes those can cause anxiety related symptoms too, and that we're hyper focusing on something that's making us anxious. Um, we're having a hard time getting schoolwork done. So now we're stressing about that. We're worrying about what people say about us in the classroom. Depression, we talk about adjustment disorders too. That can happen when you have a big life change and usually those symptoms do go away. Um, and it still can be treated like anxiety, but is there something that could be causing it that doesn't mean it's a long-term anxiety issue? Um, and then lastly, it's just shyness. Some kids are, they are more introverted. And I think it's, you know, shyness and, and introversion are not always embraced in our culture. Um, and so I think that it's good to reflect and think as, as a parent, am I just a lot more outgoing? Does my social battery need to be filled a lot more than my child's? Um, and, and that's okay. I know I, I had a conversation with a parent recently um, who she had twins and she was saying um, one of them loves to go and do all these activities after school and she's really worried about the other one because they didn't as much and was worried like is there social anxiety like what's going on there 
Um, but she really wasn't showing any signs of social anxiety. She was more so showing signs of just really being drained at the end of the day because she is a more introverted child. And so she was extending herself all day and it was time to come home and be quiet. So that is totally fine too if you have a kiddo who is more introverted. All righty. So now we've talked about a lot of stuff. Uh, talked about what anxiety is, what it isn't. Um, and you may be thinking, okay, so what, what do I even do now? Because now I'm concerned we might have something else going on or I can't figure out what it is that's causing it. Um, and if you do get in that in that situation, you can always call in an expert at that point. Good place to start sometimes is seeking out therapy. A lot of times a therapist can give you an idea. Is this likely just anxiety? Or are they seeing something else? Um, if you are more concerned that it could be something like ang or, uh, ADHD or autism in addition to what they're experiencing, um, it may be good to do an evaluation of some kind um, just to kind of pick it all apart there. Because I found that once you have an answer for where this is coming from, the treatment can vary greatly. Um, do we want to take a more of a therapeutic approach, approach, more of a behavioral approach? What is, you know, I know parents ask a lot too, like, I need to know what is it can't do versus it won't do problem. Um, so I know where I can push them because we want our kids to be challenged and pushed. But if it's something where they truly can't do that skill at this time because they don't have the skills for it, then we need to know that might be something we lay off of and teach the skills. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not, we're targeting what's actually going on. And so what are some things that we can do? That's where we're going to talk about some good strategies, tools, things to kind of reflect on a little bit. Um, I often have the question of kind of like, what is my role as a parent um, in this situation? Like, I feel like I'm trying to parent. I'm trying to be, you know, teacher with homework. I'm trying to handle the behavior. So what am I supposed to do? Um, and one of the biggest things, you know, support is the word here. But one thing I want to point out, too, is kind of looking at goodness of fit. So think about, you know, the situations that your child's getting most anxious in. Are they in, you know, the appropriate activities? Um, are they on the right track as far as what they're doing school wise, um, what they're working on? Are these things a good fit for them? Because I think that, you know, I deal with this a lot with high schoolers um, where maybe they've always wanted to follow in a parent's footsteps, but then they realize that's really not, you know, something that I'm good at or not really up my alley. Or maybe they th always thought I'd go straight to college right out of um, high school. And now they're thinking, you know what, I need a little bit of time um, to kind of learn some more skills before I head that direction. Um, so kind of taking a second and thinking, or even, you know, with sports, like, are they in a sport where they, they truly are able to excel there? Or is there something that they might be able to do where they feel a little more success? Think about someone trying to shove you in a box you don't fit in. And sometimes this is totally, you're not even thinking about it or you haven't even, you know, it was never something that was intentional. But think about your own, you know, yourself when you, you feel like you're being forced into a social box or a box at work where you're like, I just don't fit here. Like, this is not where my skills are. I'm not strong here. Um, it's good to do a little reflection and think, are we kind of creating some tension because of the situation that, or a, yeah, a situation that they're in. I mean, I always like to talk a lot about modeling and overparenting. parenting. Um, over parenting is kind of a harsh word, but I think it's, you know, when we look at research, over parenting is actually a risk factor for anxiety. Um, I think, you know, as parents, we want to always make sure that we set our kids up for success, that they're prepared everywhere they go. Um, and it's actually something that can be harmful. So a good example is like if your child's leaving the house and it's cold, frigid, like like our recent experience of living in Alaska here. Um, and you want to say, do you have your jacket? Do you have your mittens? Are you ready? Are you, do you have a hat for school? Are you, you know, all these different things. And what you want to kind of reflect on is think about natural consequences. Um, and, you know, in all situations, this is not always appropriate, but, you know, if you are always having the argument of wearing a jacket and they are insistent that they do not want a jacket, um, you let it, sometimes it's okay to let things play out. They'll either be cold and then they'll remember next time to bring a jacket or they won't be bothered by it. And then you'll realize, you know what, this is not a battle that I'm willing to fight every single day. So I think it's always good to let these things play out a little bit. And we'll talk about some other examples of, of that later. Um, but even things like when they have situations with friends that are not a positive situation, um, it can be things that they want to eat or wear. Um, thinking about situations where you can kind of let it play out and see, you know, let them learn from the situation. Because that's the biggest thing with resilience. Um, is that we want to teach kids all of these ways to deal with hard situations on the front end rather than on the back end whenever they're not living with us anymore or they're an adult and even if they are still living with us that they need to be more independent. 
So by letting them have some situations where they, you know, fail or things don't go their way, we can provide a supportive environment for having the conversation of, huh, yeah, we probably want to pack our jacket next time um, and helping them with that the next time and reminding them. Um, that's a good example of being able to let them or even with grades, if they you know, will not do the homework that night at some point, you have to let them, you know, and it, the grade at school will probably not be great. But sometimes those natural consequences really do wonders where, you know, it doesn't matter how many times mom or dad says something, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they don't want to do it. So um, just kind of think of opportunities maybe where you could scale back a little bit on things that aren't, aren't going to, you know, greatly affect their future, but where you could let those things play out a little bit so you can provide a supportive environment for them to learn. All right. So as a parent, just a couple things to kind of keep in mind. Um, sometimes it is hard when you have a child, especially the teenage years, or a child who has a lot of needs, um, be it emotionally, physically, whatever's going on, it's exhausting. Um, and it's hard, it's hard as a parent to balance taking care of yourself and the other children um, and a child who has a lot of needs. Um, so a couple things to just point out to highlight here. Um, honesty is a big thing. If you feel like because of some of the things that have been going on with your kiddo, you're struggling with them, um, you know, having conversations and saying, you know, hey, I didn't love the way that I handled this situation. So um, I kind of I want to make that right and tell you how I wish I would have handled it. And let's kind of move on from this and, and feel better. Um, and so these are things and ideas for kind of how to build that resilience in your kiddo, teach them strategies so that later in life, they're not so anxious because they know how to handle situations. Um, let them know that you want to work on your relationship with them. If that's something where you feel like you guys are always butting heads um, and be it because some of their anxiety behaviors are getting in the way of you guys getting out of the house on time or getting to bed in a, a timely manner. Um, tell them, you know, what are some things we can do together? I really want to spend some more time with you doing something other than us kind of button heads. Um, and I think, too, being aware of if you're in a place where you've got a lot going on and you might need to kind of seek your own therapy or supports for a little bit while you work on things with your kiddo, too. Always good to keep in mind that it is OK to, um, you know, learn some of those skills yourself, because I know sometimes we a lot has changed in a couple of generations. And it's now we all know we can do better than what we saw. Um, growing up. And so I think that learning and growing from your own experiences um, is a wonderful thing to show and teach your child. And I do want to say sometimes you do have to play the parent card. Um, there are times when you can see that your child may really want to be able to participate or be in situations that are anxiety producing for them. There's times where you can tell it's just not a good fit, but there's times where, like, for instance, if they want to be on a swim team, but they're just really worried about that first day, um, what do you have to do to get them there the first day? And that may be that you say, listen, you have to pick some kind of activity at home that's movement. It can be we join the swim team. It can be that we play outside for 30 minutes a day, but you have to pick something with some kind of movement every day. It can be, you know, you say, listen, we'll take you to the first practice and then we'll go get whatever you want for dinner. So sometimes you have to pull that card of like, we're going to go to this and we're going to do it because, you know, it will be good for them. And then the long term, they can kind of make that decision if it's the right fit. But it is OK to play the parent card sometimes, too. And a few things to think about home environment wise, um, when we're talking about anxiety as a whole, the feel of the home, meaning do you have, you know, is it totally chaotic at home where you got a kid, everybody's at home at one time running around, someone's eating dinner, someone's not. What can we do if there's something that you notice every night that we're having some anxiety related to, you see it bubbling over when they come home from school, um, or maybe they've held it together and then you get a totally different version at home. Um, what can you do to kind of maybe get everybody calmed down a little bit in the afternoon? So maybe having a lot of outdoor rowdy play for a little bit or upstairs, wherever you can send everybody um, and then having some quiet time. It's totally fine to say, listen, we got 30 minutes. We're going to do a quiet activity. Um, one of my favorite things to do is make a quiet activity board where you can list out the activities for different ages or different children. Um, what can you do when for an activity where there's no adult involved? So something where you don't have to facilitate it. Um, and have them come up with some ideas and leave some blanks where they can fill in some new ideas they come up with later. And it can be anything that's quiet. It can be, you know, you can make a kinetic sandbox. You can have, um, there's some really great books like the little Dr. Quicksall books you can get offline. You can get some little, there are little mystery puzzles, um, some little quiet time activity books, stuff like that for them to play with, toys that are just quiet toys um, to have that quiet time so that if you do have a child who needs that, you can kind of facilitate that a little bit too. But just general things like food, vitamins, exercise, sleep. Those are so important too. 
Um, and that is so hard when you have a child who has some sensory sensitivities. Um, you know, they are not always down for trying new foods. And sometimes you worry about, are they getting the nutrition that they need? But I think it's good too to kind of have those open, honest conversations with your doctor so they can give you some advice as far as, okay, we've got these sensory sensitivities with food. How can we still make sure we're getting, you know, what they need so that they can sleep well and operate well too? Just a few more things here. So discipline, um, as it, I always have this conversation too about how do we discipline a kiddo who gets really anxious um, and a kid who doesn't handle typical methods of, you know, redirection very well. Um, and like we talked about earlier, when we talk about natural and logical consequences, I always encourage parents to, to think through, okay, let's think about the behavior and then what makes sense based off what they did. So like, for example, if they're yelling, if they yell at you, um, taking away the computer isn't really linked to that. So we want to try to find, based off what the behavior is, a linked consequence related to that. So like sending them to a place to calm down, that's more linked to that because we're trying to teach them something from it. Um, I think when we have these conversations, a lot of times it's because parents feel like, am I doing the right thing? Am I shaming them? Or like, how do I make this productive? Um, and discipline is part of life. We have to teach kids, you know, we have to correct them sometimes because they need to grow up and be, you know, happy, productive members of society. But we also want to make sure that we're teaching through the experience. So like if they break something, they have to replace it. And that might be through doing chores or whatever they have to do. Um, if they disrespect you, then they lose a privilege of something you do for them. So if they don't do homework, they get a zero. So I think it's good to remember, let's look for some natural consequences, natural logical consequences for behaviors and also be careful about double disciplining too. So like for instance, if they don't do the homework and they get a zero, maybe the first time that's their consequence, you got a zero. For some kids, that's not always motivating. Um, but for a lot of kids, that can be the consequence. We learn from that, we move on. Um, so that way you don't get where they're hiding things from you and stuff like that because they're worried they'll come home and get disciplined again too. Um, you know, obviously each situation is different, but just thinking about how can I make this logical so that this is something that as they grow up, they remember, these are the kind of consequences that happen, not just that I only do this stuff because I don't want to get in trouble at home. I do it because I don't want, you know, the logical thing that will happen to happen. A um, couple of things as far as giving choices, I think are important too. You can't always do that, but when there's times where it doesn't matter what order they do things in, um, I think it's always good to say, okay, um, what can, let's talk about what we have here that we need to get done tonight. And here are the three things I need you to do. Write it down on a piece of paper. You pick the order. I don't care. If you want to do these two things before dinner, that's fine. If you want to do them after, that's fine too. Um, so looking at some options there for giving choices so that we can try to avoid some of these situations escalating. It's always helpful. Um, and modeling self-regulation. <laughs> Isn't this hard? Um, whenever, you know, they have really just worn your patients down by the end of the day. Uh, we want to try to model, like, even if you don't do it perfectly the first time, communicate that. And say, gosh, I lost my cool in that situation. That wasn't pleasant. Um, so that's what I'm going to work on for next time. But here's kind of what we're working with now. So just a couple ideas there as far as kind of disciplining and, and handling when those situations do arise and ways to kind of try to avoid them escalating for a kid who already has some level of anxiety and worries about being in trouble and stuff like that. So what do we do about school? Um, you know, a lot of kids, their anxiety is related to school. Where do we start there um, and how do we help them? So, you know, fortunately for kiddos who are at um, John Croslin, I think a big thing to keep in mind is you guys do have smaller class sizes and you can work with kiddos earlier on rather than it having to become a big problem first. Um, but if you are having issues, there are things that I'm sure the teachers will be willing to help support you with at school, especially if you're working with a therapist or something at home who's offered some good strategies, communicating that with the teacher, because the more that we can reinforce what they're working on, um, at school and at home, the better the generalization is going to be. Um, look at, you know, rewarding for using the coping mechanisms. So we want to start really small. So when we talk about what those coping mechanisms can be. We want to reward for even just trying one, um, for even, you know, bringing it up in that moment and start really small and then eventually rewarding them for using them. And that isn't using, that's not natural reinforcers. <laughs> we want to get to that place. But sometimes for kids, it, not all kids do these things click naturally. Um, you have to start with some kind of external reinforcement before it starts to click. And then they realize, hey, you know, if I go to school or if I take this test or if I give my best effort and study for this test, then good things happen for me. Um, so it's a way to kind of progress to that point. 
we talk a lot about social media, screen time. Um, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no more than about one hour per day, which is really hard to regulate and deal with in the world of working parents and work at home and all of those different things. Um, so you may not always be able to stick exactly to that, but it is a good kind of guideline to keep in mind um, just so that we don't get to where it's a place where it's increasing so much anxiety for kids. A lot of when we talk about what causes it is they see things online and it can be a variety of different things. Like I know, you know, a kid I had in recently had watched a video on TikTok that was oh, too deep about, you know, the, the circle of life, basically just understanding how, um, you know, life and death conversations that kids in fourth, fifth grade really just don't need to be having. Um, now, had a senior in high school watch that, would they have been as affected by it? Probably not. But that's the issue is it wasn't something that was going to be blocked by parental controls, uh, but it's something that is still very impactful for a kiddo. So we can set all the limits in the world and they still may have access to those things. So that's why setting time limits can be good so that they can only have so much exposure to it. Um, and then it can also be bullying online. It can be things like kids are talking about each other, making fake profiles. So the more we can limit that access, the better. Um, but the best things I would suggest is staying up on um, the trends with what kids are using, what apps they're using. Every week there's some new app that they can use to hide or block something that they're looking at or where parents can't see it that looks like one app and it's actually something else. Um, so I think that just kind of staying in the know, talking with other parents, like keeping abreast of all of these things is really important. And I think modeling it at home too. I know it's hard because I know when I get home, sometimes I just want to veg out. I want to sit on the couch, scroll through social media and just kind of click off my brain for a little bit, but kids watch everything we do. Um, they are so aware of what parents' habits are. And then when you try to tell them not to do something, they're like, but you're doing it. So I think it's good to just remember they're watching um, and to just kind of be aware of that. So a couple of strategies here we'll chat about, and then we'll talk about, you know, if you've tried all these things at home, prevention, all of that stuff, where can we kind of go from here? Um, these are things I'm sure you have heard about before. Um, obviously, these are good strategies to use. One of my favorite is the deep breathing. And if you can't get kids to use it consistently, one strategy that I learned through a child I used to work with um, is using, like if you have a younger kid, having your fingers up as birthday candles and having them try to blow them out. Um, so a lot of times, like I know one of the kiddos I used to work with would say, would be so upset, anxious, and would say like, I want to settle down. Like I want to, you know, calm down, but like couldn't, could not make themselves do it. So one thing you can do is like have them pretend that your fingers are candles and then make joke, you kind of joke around about it. Like, oh, you didn't blow hard enough. And, and that kind of thing to try to get them to focus on something to you, do some deeper breathing, like take a big breath and blow it out. Um, so that works well with like preschoolers, kindergarten up through first, second grade. That's a good strategy there. Another good one is for older kids. They have the Apple Watch. You can use the breathing app off of there. Um, and then also watching some of the videos on YouTube to teach yourself those things to try to use in those moments when you get upset. Um, there's some great stuff on YouTube for pro progressive muscle relaxation and visualization. And the research is actually really solid on them. Um, and so you wanna learn it from YouTube um, or from another resource like through your therapist and then put it that way they have some tools in their tool, um, their toolbox to be able to use when they're feeling more anxious. But there's some great ones online where you can, I think this works well with kids. At least I've had good success with it because we need to think about things that are age appropriate. But like the visualization is where you'll work on pre, uh, envisioning some, a place where you're really happy, somewhere where you had a, like maybe your birthday party or being at home with your dog on the couch, whatever it is that you really enjoy doing. And so you can always remind them, okay, let's, Let's get back to that place. Come on, let's think about that. And it's a good time to kind of try to model that for them. Will they do it every time? No, that is the, the hardest thing about kids is that they're not quite at that place cognitively where they're totally able to regulate these things themselves, or they would obviously have these things more under control. Um, so we really just need to give them a selection of tools to use, remind them to use them and model it for them. And then that's the best that we can do to kind of help them on the preventative side. When these things start a little bit or you start noticing they might be showing some signs of anxiety. Um, physical activity too, you can distract them. Like, let's go outside, let's take a lap. Even if you're in the classroom, let's go take a lap for a second. Sometimes just getting up and moving, removing yourself from the situation is all that you need. But then there are times that we can try all these different things and we're still like, okay, we have done these things at home. We've talked about 
Um, you know, we've changed up some ways of doing our routines. We've, you know, tried to get them in social situations a little bit more so they feel comfortable, but we're still struggling a lot. Um, a lot of times we think there's only one kind of therapy out there um, and there's not, there's lots of different things that you can look at. So we look at CBT is pretty common. It's trying to change our negative thinking, but for little kids, that's not always productive. They're not quite at the place to be able to do that yet. We look at more play therapy for little kids and that's where they learn through playing with the therapist, um, you know, with dolls kind of enacting things like if these situations happen, what do we do? Um, exposure therapy for things like social anxiety. It's one of the best research ways of handling it or, you know, claustrophobia, things like that. If they have some difficulties with uh, being out in large crowds or small spaces or whatever it is they're struggling with. Um, and then mindfulness based therapy is usually integrated um, into most of the other therapy types. But um, so that is all I have as far as, you know, some tools, strategies, things to kind of think about. I think, you know, the biggest thing for me when we look at anxiety is, um, let's see, let me pull this back up, is trying to be preventative as much as possible. Um, so we want to try to be on the front end of trying to put them in situations and things to prevent these things from happening. But we do know that anxiety is a huge piece of life um, and that we will encounter it. I mean, as adults, you encounter it every day. There's things that are anxiety producing situations. We want to look at learning opportunities. So how can we take these situations that are not fun um, and most of us would feel our negative experiences and make them learning opportunities to build resilience? So looking for those little ways that you can kind of model, um, use natural consequences, um, think about what is this communicating, teaching them to kind of recognize and reflect as they get older, what, what is wrong? Why does my body not feel good? Um, you know, those are all solid tools there and all really linked to building some resilience. So, um, that is all that I have, but I don't know if you guys have any, have any questions or anything like that. We jump into questions first, Jennifer, I want to thank you very much for, all of the information you shared, I know it was a lot, um, and I saw quite a few people jotting down notes and things as you were talking. So I think it was really beneficial. I am going to stop the recording so that everyone feels comfortable with the Q&A. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that I am stopping that now.